Good morning. Welcome to all of you on this mid-August morning. I can't believe we're halfway through the month. Thank you, Diane, for the lovely music that welcomed us to worship today. Whether you're linking in via Zoom, joining in at a later date, or are here in person, we sincerely welcome you. We welcome back Pastor Claire um, from Leave today. We trust the time away is really um, been time of rest and rejuvenation, and we look forward to catching up with you and Gloria again in the next few weeks. We trust that each person worshiping with us will truly experience God's love. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anunnaki, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. We give thanks for their provision of this land and strive to continue to work together and to continued reconciliation. Our ushers are here to assist at any time throughout the service, and we have washrooms just off the sanctuary. We'll take a couple of moments for announcements. If anyone has something they'd like to highlight, I invite you to come forward now. A reminder that in less than a month, on the 14th of September, we're hosting our community barbecue again, and so there is lots of opportunity um, for help that day, and we'll learn more about that in the next week or two, I'm sure. If there's nothing else, then um, we'll just have a time of quiet, and as we move into worship, let's quiet our hearts and minds to listen for God's voice in this calming segment of music. <clears throat> Please join in the responsive call to worship as it's displayed, reading the part of the people. If you are delighted to be here, and if you're tired or troubled, you are welcome. If your faith is strong, and if your faith is battered or frail, you are welcome. If you are eager to praise God, and if you need to be quiet, you are welcome. God welcomes us all to worship today and promises to meet us here. Let's pray together. Your people, Lord, come from different places today with different stories to tell. Show us your steadfast love, O oh God. Your people come weighed down with their own unique bundle of burdens. Restore and renew us, O oh God. Your people come, ready to hear your word, proclaimed anew. Revive us again, O Lord, and so that we may rejoice in you. Amen. I'll invite our song leaders for our first songs of praise. Good morning. We will be singing two songs of praise this morning. Uh, please stand if you're able and join us in singing God of Our Strength, number 47, for our first opening song. Oh 
for our second song, we'll be singing 601, Lead Me, Guide Me. a very good song to uh, lead into the Joseph stories. You can imagine Joseph having sung that song or that sentiment through uh, all the different phases of his life. If you were here last week, you know that we began a pulpit series on Old Testament Joseph, and we started by looking back three generations of his family tree and noticing some rotten values growing there for generations. Such negative forces express themselves in Joseph being sold by his older brothers into slavery in Egypt. And there in Egypt, we discover who Joseph becomes or who Joseph is apart from his family. Something important for all of us to discover. And we find out that God's hand is strong upon him. And thanks to that, along with the gifts that he has and the sense of integrity he carries with him, he rises to the top in whatever situation he is in. In Genesis 39, he is sold to Potiphar, an Egyptian cap captain. And there we read in verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. 
When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and he became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Read on in verse 6, it also says that Joseph was well built and handsome, which sounds like a good thing, until Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. She is unsuccessful, then she lashes out at him, accuses him falsely, and Joseph ends up in jail. But even in prison, Joseph rises to the top from verse 20. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. And then in Genesis 40, there's some foreshadowing of how Joseph will get out of prison. Two prisoners, Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's uh, baker, they each have a dream. And Joseph has this thing with the dreams, right? Joseph interprets their dreams correctly. He tells the cupbearer he will be restored to his position, and he tells the baker he will not, and the baker is hung. Joseph asks the cupbearer to remember him when he gets up to uh, Pharaoh's court, but that cupbearer forgets until two years later when Pharaoh has dreams that no one can interpret. He has a dream about seven ugly gaunt cows consuming seven sleek fat ones and seven thin heads of grain swallowing up seven full healthy heads of grain. That's when the cupbearer remembers Joseph and his ability to interpret dreams. And Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. Joseph gives, gives God the credit for his interpretation and tells Pharaoh that dream, these dreams mean there will, there will be seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine, and that Pharaoh should stock up food in those years of abundance to prepare for the bad ones. And then verse 39, now Joseph rising to the top again. Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So, Joseph has risen to the top of the kingdom. And after seven good years, the famine comes. And with the famine come Joseph's older brothers looking to buy some grain. That part of the story begins in chapter 42. And Betty, and Aunt, Betty Ann and I will read the first part of it. Please, Betty Ann. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. 
the youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, Just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you're telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your bro youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come to us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Joseph turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. So far the reading of God's word. Thank you, Lydia. The Old Testament Joseph stories, especially this middle part, might be the oldest rags to riches stories uh, ever written. Here, Joseph goes from being a foreign slave to being second in command of an entire nation. He moves from the depths of prison to sitting on the heights of the throne room of Egypt. It's like the American dream, some 4,000 years before there was such a thing. And it tempts us to look at these chapters and this story as a lesson on the secret to success and what it takes to succeed in this world, how to go from rags to riches yourself. And there's lots of interest in that today and in these days in finding and selling the secret of success in this world. Flip through any media and there's no end to advice on how to strike it rich, how to become successful, how to rise to the top like cream. There's stock market advice, there's shark tank entertainment, there's inside info on tax breaks and government grants to explore, exploit, there's amazing strategies on how to strike it rich in real estate, there's exercise equipment that will prosper your energy, and there's enough glamour advice to scroll through eternity. And some of it comes with a Christian label slapped on it. I wonder, what do you make of such pitches? And how do you evaluate them? Closer to home, when you look back over your own life, how do you evaluate how you've done in your own pursuit of success? And what stand behind the good that you enjoy in life? How did your cream rise? Or are you still waiting for it to? More to the point for today, what made Joseph successful? Is it something that would sell in today's world? I kind of doubt it. The way I see it, the key to Joseph's success would not sell well, nor would it necessarily lead to success in another situation for another person. In fact, it could lead to collapse. The way I see it, the key to success in Joseph's adult life was the same thing that did him in at points. It made him refuse the seductions of Potiphar's wife, which landed him in jail. And it gave him the stature to honestly tell Pharaoh's cupbearer the good news that he would be restored to his position, and Pharaoh's baker the bad news that he would not survive. The key to Joseph's success might even be what made him speak so sternly to his older brothers when they showed up. 
and then made him turn around the corner and weep. I imagine it's what's behind testing them so severely and then much later welcoming them with open arms. And I'm not sure what quite to call that character quality. But honesty is a big part of it, as well as being a God-honoring person. And it includes the honest expression of his personal emotional baggage. He had deep issues to sort through regarding his family. He had things to deal with that you cannot deal with glibly. More on that next week. And he stayed true to being a God-honoring person. He was faithful to his core, even if it did him in or threatened to. The things he does to his older brothers are not nice, but they are honest and they are valid. And most importantly, their goal is reconciliation, not revenge. And the Bible also makes it clear repeatedly saying that the Lord was with Joseph and blessed him and blessed him with gifts, especially about interpreting dreams that played a big role in propelling him to the top. He had that gift of discerning dreams. You also told he was well built and handsome and he must have had phenomenal administrative ability. And even without his personal faithful integrity, those gifts could have made him a success story. But without faithful integrity, most likely he would not have risen to the top as cream, as something good. Cream isn't the only thing that rises. There's a lot of scuzzy stuff that floats. You can find as much sleaze at the top as anywhere else. Check any sewage lagoon. <laughs> Joseph held fast to his honesty before God and people and kept rising to the top as cream. That was God's plan for him. Not everybody's on the same plan. There are a lot of successful people who are short on integrity and a lot of people with deep faithful integrity who are short on success as the world defines it. Don't expect success and integrity to be in lockstep with each other. Don't consider one to be a measure of the other. Simply put, don't compromise your integrity to achieve success. Joseph didn't. His honesty before God was more important than success in Potiphar's household. You could look at him at that point and think, that's where a squeaky clean attitude gets you. It does you no good. It puts you in jail for a crime you did not commit. But Joseph wasn't governed by the short run or by what is unfair in life. He had plenty of that. He stayed faithful to his course. And when, good news, when a good news dream came, he told the good news. And when a bad news dream came, he gave the bad news. And it takes courage to do that. And he's also honest in saying that the interpretations were not his. They were God's. That was God's gift to him. And a lot of gifted people have no sense of that kind of humility. Even when he's called before Pharaoh, the guy right on top, the one who has power over life and death of everyone, he humbly and honestly gave him the good and the bad news. And if you've ever had to tell your boss some bad news about his or her situation, you might sense how hard that is. Kings tend to do away with people who give them bad news they do not want to hear. Joseph could have gone the way of the baker for this. But here in Genesis, God blessed Joseph's integrity, and Joseph is promoted to second in command of the entire land. So Joseph has it made. He's about 30 years old. Next to Pharaoh, he's the most powerful, most successful man in all of Egypt. 13 years ago, doesn't look long from this side of life, 13 years ago he was a cistern-shocked teenage slave. Now a foreign country is at his feet, and responsibility for that country is heaped upon his shoulders. And for the next seven years he does an outstanding job of storing up grain for the bad years to come. Blessings abound all around. 
the slave days, the false accusation, accusation, the two years of being forgotten in prison, they are all behind him now. He is basking in the abundant provisions of God, having the best life the Egyptian empire can offer. And it's fair to say at this point in the story, we have a lesson on remain, maintain your integrity, remain faithful and true, and see what God does with that. Here we see what God did with that for Joseph. God prospered Joseph as few have prospered since, but we're still very far from a happily ever after ending. In fact, it kind of feels like all this prospering is setting Joseph up for the greatest challenge he'll ever face. Because here at the pinnacle of his success, Joseph is thrown into an unexpected tailspin that threatens to undo him. Because next comes the famine, and Joseph is hurled back to a deep pit of pain. Next comes the famine, and with it, Joseph's older brothers, bowing down before him, just as his dream had said they would. They are at his feet. There they are, begging to buy grain so they can live. He hadn't seen him in 20 years. Last time he saw him, he was begging for his life. And then watching, watching them count their cash as the Ishmaelites carted him off to Egypt. And now, there's J Joseph, about 37 years old. He has felt the hand of God upon him through thick and thin. There is Joseph, the most successful man in all the land. There is Joseph internally falling apart in the face of his starving, begging, ignorant brothers who are face down before him. Why? What do you think that's all about? How would you understand it? Maybe you felt a twitch of that sometime when a childhood trauma resurfaced and you felt like a child again. Your childhood self was there and you were at a loss on how to deal with it. Such trauma can create deep visceral woundedness that sticks around if unresolved. So although no, Joseph knows exactly where he stands before God, exactly where he stands before the entire nation, he does not know how to stand in his own family. He's kaput. He's a wreck before them. And he can't handle it. Turns around a corner, bursts into tears. That's how much pull families have. That's how much pull even abusive families have. That's how much pull they have on even the most successful people. It's fascinating, it's disturbing how that works. You can be number one in your job, you can be number one in your department, in your country, number two in the country, and you can have God be number one in your life and feel God's blessings all around, and yet, if you have unresolved trauma in your life, if there is Joseph-like pain in your family experience, it can undermine all of that, for a while at least, and throw you into a tailspin. And because every family is imperfect, there are shades of that in each of our lives. How do you deal with that? What did Joseph do? That's where we're heading next week. You might want to read ahead the rest of the Joseph story, Genesis 45 to 50. See if you understand what's going on in those chapters. It's a complicated back and forth stuff. And wonder about as you read it, how does that fit into my life or maybe the life of someone I know? Let us pray. Loving Lord, Thank you for your word, for stories that reach back to millennia, for stories that speak to us in our time. Thank you for stories that probe dynamics we wrestle with and remind us that your presence is upon us as it has been upon people throughout the long march of history. We pray that such stories 
Help us become the people you call us to be, people that love our neighbors as ourselves, people who love ourselves and see ourselves, how we have been seen through many things. That we recognize the grace and strength we have needed and been granted. We'll continue to need and be granted as we stumble forward and that others are much the same in that regard. They are our brothers and sisters that live alongside us, near and far, that we might have agenda with. And we trust you to guide us through no nuances and shadows to resolve what needs a resolution so that we may live freely and joyfully in your good care. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join us in singing our song of response, number 203, God, our, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. We take time now to give thanks for the gifts and all the blessings God has provided to us. Thank you over the last weeks and again today of placing your offerings in the offering plate on the back table. Um, in a few moments, um, Rod's going to bring that forward and we'll um, bless our offering. If you haven't had an opportunity yet to place your card or envelope um, in the plate, it will be on the communion table after the service. Rod, I invite you to come forward now. Let's pray and give thanks. Loving and generous God, all good gifts come from you, and from these riches we bring this offering. Help us to be generous givers, both of our money and our lives. We ask your blessing, Lord, as we use our gifts to further your mission, both across the street and around the world. Amen.
Thank you again, Paul, for the words uh, in the Old Testament on Joseph. It's good to recount the story, although I'm not sure about all these to-be-continued messages. It <laughs> keeps us thinking through the week, so. But it's good, it's good nonetheless. We'll have to go home and do some homework. Claire's been doing it for a while, and now you do it, so. Anyways, let's uh, pause for our congregational prayer this morning. <clears throat> good morning, God. <clears throat> Thank you for granting us another week. For some, it may have been a struggle or challenging, but we pray that you continue to hold those people close as they battle through. For others, it was a good week and one where we could see and feel your presence. Thank you for those blessing moments. <clears throat> no matter what our pathway, no matter what pathway our life may have been on this week, we thank you for guiding us, possibly even when we did not know you were right beside us. <clears throat> we recognize more and more we live in a world of diversity, diversity of age, education, race, religious beliefs, political beliefs, economic standards, jobs, and many more. While we recognize diversity can be good and can keep us in check, we, as well we as well as help us learn more about ourselves and other people and cultures, we appreciate when we can learn from this. We also recognize that diversity can sometimes distract us, eat away at us, and even cause splits in conflict. This is not healthy. When we don't fully understand what others are thinking or possibly where they have come from, I think we can be, be, begin to form bad and unproven thoughts about that person or persons. We thank you for the words in the Old, Test Old and New Testament that make us aware that we can live in a world of diversity, recognizing that we are all created by the same maker. God, help us to learn to live in a world of diversity. Help us to have the same love, compassion, and respect for others as you showed us in the Bible. Forgive us where bad thoughts of others have entered our mind. Help us to be more open and understanding to other cultures, beliefs, and ways of doing things. This week, we lift up those of our members and loved ones who may have lingering health issues or concerns. Continue to be with those who, through health issues, may have to alter their lives, life plans, and directions. Guide their thoughts. We are thankful for the ways you have healed those who have had ailments and are continuing in their healing. We know your ways and knowledge are much higher than ours, and we ask that you continue to hear the, the spoken and unspoken words. We ask that you, as we transition into fall and new leadership, and role responsibilities that you continue to guide us and give us wisdom. Thank you for guiding us in current and future pastoral roles and transitions. We also ask that you be with those around the world that are facing war and much uncertainty. It is hard for us to fathom the pain and loss war and unrest can cause as we live here in a peaceful nation. God, be close to the innocent families and children where peace does not exist. Somehow allow the leaders of these groups to understand the frailty of life and to understand at what cost their power and decisions may be exacting. God, as we enter another week, give us strength and energy to face whatever tasks are ahead of us. For some, there may be challenges, but we trust you will provide the energy and support required to meet these hurdles. As we enter one of the last weeks of summer holidays, may we enjoy what you have to show us in nature, whether in sunrises, clouds, sunsets, meteor showers, northern lights, and yes, even the rain. We somehow know you have something to teach us in all this. May we not miss this. In all this, we ask it in your name. Amen. I'll let the song leaders come forward again. So for our last song, um, we'll need your hymnals because we do not have the permissions to put the words on the screen. Uh, so. Grab your hymnals, uh, please stand and join us in singing our closing song. We will only be doing uh, verse B, okay, in your hymnals. And remain standing for the benediction afterwards. With the words of this sun blessing settling on our hearts, go into the week knowing God is with us. God will guide us. God is our strength. Go, my friends, in peace. <laughs>